Hey, welcome back um, to week four of our Head in the Cloud series. Okay, so our series Head in the Cloud, what we're doing is we're seeing six things you need to know about the new heavens and the new earth. And we've already seen that in the new heavens and the new earth is where faith will become sight, okay? It's where obedience will become natural. It's where the deepest longings of our souls will be quenched. It's where we're gonna get the ultimate healing that the world is actually looking for. And then last week, our fifth thing we looked at, was looked at how in the new heavens, and a new earth is where we're going to get our new resurrection bodies. We're going to get these bodies that God is, God is going to redeem our body away from the curse of sin. And we're going to get these powerful, glorious bodies that actually match his body. And we're going to look at the last thing today. Okay, today we're going to look at the last thing I want you to know about the new heavens and the new earth. So this is, um, for all intents and purposes, this is the season finale. Okay, this is a season five. I know you're somewhere crying. I, I know, it's sad for me too. But the good news is um, we're gonna do a lot more of these in the future, okay? So the sixth thing that I want you to know about the new heavens and the new earth uh, is this. Drum roll, please. The new heavens and the new earth are guaranteed for the Christian. The new heavens and the new earth are guaranteed for the Christian. Friends, listen, heaven is guaranteed for current disciples of Jesus Christ. I need you to know that. I want to say that again loud and clear. Heaven is guaranteed for current followers of Jesus Christ. If you are in Christ right now, meaning if you are a Christian, you will spend eternity with God in the new heavens and the new earth. Now, one of Jesus' best friends was a guy named Ionis. Okay, Eionis. Okay, Eionis. It's a pretty cool name, right? Okay, but nevertheless, um, towards the end of Eionis' life, um, he wrote down the story of Jesus. Okay, he actually documented the story of Jesus, what he could remember from the story of Jesus, and actually reads as he reads like, This is how I found out my best friend Jesus was God. And we actually still have it today. Okay, actually, it's called John. Okay, it's the Gospel of Jesus according to John. And um, about in the middle, halfway through um, his documentation of the life of Jesus, Ionis, a.k.a. John, remembers this time when Jesus is calling himself the good shepherd and he's calling his people my sheep. Jesus is the good shepherd and the people are his sheep. And the way that Ionis remembers it, here, here's what Jesus says. He says this, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. And I and the father are one. Did you catch it? Did you see it? They will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Friends, later on in this letter to the Romans, Paul writes, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And right here, Jesus is saying, they will never perish. If you are saved, you will never perish, and no one will be able to snatch you out of the hands of God. That's a remarkable, remarkable truth. Friends, if you are saved, you are God's. If you are saved, you are His. Okay, if you're one of His sheep, meaning you are, you are saved, no one can take you from Jesus. And that right there, that, that fact, that simple fact should make you excited because that's a promise. And God is big when it comes to promises. God is huge when it comes to promises. What do you think about when you think about God? In other words, what characteristics of God come to your mind whenever you think about God? For some of you, it may be love, the fact that God is love. For some of you, um, you think about uh, the fact that God is holy. For some of you, you think about the majesty of God and just how otherworldly He is. For others of you, you think about God's creativity. I mean, he created everything from Saturn to oxygen. 
But what do you think about whenever you think about God? Friends, now almost 10 years reading this book cover to cover, what I can very, very clearly see is that one of the ways that God wants you to view him is God wants you to view him as a God who is trustworthy. God wants you to view him as a God, okay, who you can actually trust. Okay, AKA, what he promises is going to actually happen. God wants you to pray and trust him because he is trustworthy. He wants you to know that he is trustworthy and he's a promise fulfilling God. For example, um, Jesus' first coming. Okay, did you know that Jesus is announced on page three of the Bible? But Jesus only actually shows up when the Bible is like 75% over? In between that, in the Old Testament, book after book after book, God is telling the people, listen, I am going to send Jesus. I am going to send the Messiah. I am going to send the anointed one. I am going to send the, the son of man. I am going to send the Christos. I'm going to send one who is going to reverse the curse. This world full of car accidents and cancer, I am going to reverse the curse by sending my son. And he did this. He promised this for century after century after century after century after century. And in the left side of your Bible, those Old Testament patriarchs, those Old Testament priests, those Old Testament princes, those Old Testament prophets, they must have had moments where they went, is this ever going to happen? Is this ever going to actually happen? They must have had moments of doubt where they're like, man, God keeps promising to send his son. Or he keeps promising to send the one that's going to fix all this. Is this ever going to actually happen? He promised that to our grandpa too. And his great-grandpa too. Is this actually ever going to happen? And then what happens? <laughs> the story does not end with Malachi. <laughs> Jesus comes. He actually shows up. On your screen right now, I'm putting a graphic on your screen and look at all of the ways that Jesus fulfilled Old Testament prophecy. It's book after book after book. God is creating a more vivid image of what he's going to look like. And look at the right side, all of the things that Jesus fulfilled. Okay, all of the ways Jesus Christ fulfilled those promises of God. Look at that for a second. Do you see it? You see it? This happens all throughout the scriptures. And this should make us readers go, wow, he is faithful. God is faithful. Okay, even if you have things in the Bible you disagree with. Okay, that's, that's what happens in every relationship. Like You have people you disagree with. Even if you have things like, man, I just don't see why God did X, Y, Z. You can at least look at like, that's a God who fulfills promises. He is a God who is faithful. And when you see that God is faithful when it comes to your eternal destiny, maybe you can join Paul. Here's what Paul says. This is an ex-murderer, an ex-Christian killer. Here's what he says about his security in Jesus Christ. He says this, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also give with him, also with him, graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God, God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor 
anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing will separate you from the love of God if you are in Christ. Listen, heaven is guaranteed. Guaranteed for current disciples of Jesus. If you are in Christ now, if you are a Christian, you will spend eternity with Jesus. And like those patriarchs, those princes, those prophets, those priests in the Old Testament, they had moments where they go, oh, is Jesus ever going to come? Born of Nazareth? Die on the cross? That sounds like a fairy tale. Is he ever going to actually come? And then he came. We're in that same position right now, 1 Corinthians 10 tells us. We're in that same position right now. Let us trust God. Let us understand that if you are in Christ, man, heaven is guaranteed for the Christian. So our sixth and final thing is this. The new heavens and new earth are guaranteed for the Christian. Which begs the question, are you saved? Have you ever actually given your life to Jesus Christ? Have you ever officially made Jesus Christ your personal Lord and Savior? Have you ever, have you ever acknowledged Jesus Christ as King and repented in front of a holy God? Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ? Maybe you're watching this on Instagram and you don't really come to church. Or maybe you do come to Cornerstone, but Leo is just, wow, 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 you just don't even listen to anything I, I say. And you've been kind of going through the motions. Or maybe you just watch, you stumbled upon this on YouTube and, te- and this is 10 years, 20, 30 right now. It's 10 years later. Either way, I want to ask you, are, are you saved? Do you know him? Do you know God? We're in an era, we're in a society that brags about all sorts of things. People boast about all sorts of things. For example, like on November 4th, after this next election, people are going to be bragging and boasting about that their candidate won, right? People brag and boast about all sorts of things. But we have the Word of God. And He tells us, if there's going to be one thing you boast for, here it is. This is Jeremiah 9.23. It says this, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the, wise, uh, the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. God says, listen, for the man who brags, for the woman who brags, for the teenager who brags, for the seventh grader who brags, for anybody on earth who brags, there's only one thing worth bragging about, that they understand and know me, the living God. Do you know him? And friends, you can know him. You can spend forever with Jesus Christ. You can spend forever with Jesus Christ. Now, again, we're living in a world where there's a lot of silly myths, a lot of silly lies that go around. And one of the silliest lies, it's like quietly silly, one of the silliest lies out there is, I'm basically a good person. I can get myself to heaven. I am a good person. I can get myself to heaven. That is a lie from Satan. That is not true at all. And the way I always break it down for the students here is the tape recorder example. Okay? The tape recorder example. So here's the example I give to you. If you're you're in the camp of thinking, I can get myself to heaven, here's a tape recorder example. It's this right here. Imagine your whole life. Okay? Your entire life. From the time you were born to right now, your whole life, there's been an invisible recording device around your neck this whole time. There's been an invisible recording device around your neck this entire time. And it doesn't record everything you say. It only starts recording whenever you use the word should. 
Or it only starts recording whenever you give somebody else advice. Hey, you should be nicer. Hey, you should follow the law. Hey, you should clean up your room. Hey, you should clean up your act. Hey, you should listen to your parents. Hey, you shouldn't do that. You should do that. It only starts recording. The device only starts recording whenever you give other people advice. Now, picture yourself dying and judgment day comes and you get in front of God and God goes, you know what? I'm having a really good day, a really chill day. I'm going to give you the most relaxed, most easy judgment day in history. I'm not going to judge you according to Jesus or the Bible. I'm going to judge you based on your own advice you give to others. I'm just going to judge you based on your own standards. And the big question I'm going to basically ask you is, did you live up to your own advice? Do you always live up to your own standards? If the answer is yes, you get to come in. If the answer is no, you know what happens. <laughs> Friends, for most of it, including me, the answer is no. <laughs> You know at your core, you don't even live up to your own standards. The advice you give, you don't live up to any of those things. We are all at our core. We are hypocrites. And the shocking thing is, those are just your standards. Can you imagine the standards of a holy, perfect, set-apart, pure God? There's no one that's passing that test. No one that's going to actually pass judgment day on his own merit, on his own skill, on his own goodness. You can't get to heaven on your own. Friends, people always say this. There's one way to heaven. There's one way to heaven. No, there's actually not one way to heaven. There's two. There are two ways to heaven. Way number one is this. Be perfect. Be perfect and be sinless. Don't ever make any mistakes be absolutely, from birth till death, be perfect and sinless. That's way number one in heaven. If you do that, God will gladly give you. He lets innocent people in, right? That's way number one in heaven. And we know we've all botched that by now. What's this way number two? How to get to heaven? Accept the mercy and the grace that comes from Jesus Christ alone. He took the test for us. He lived the life that we could not live. He lived a perfect, sinless life. Okay, he was absolutely perfect. And whenever you place your faith in him, he gives that perfection to you. So right now, okay, right now, God does not look down and see Leo's stupidity. He sees a son because I am drenched in the innocent blood of Jesus. On the cross, Jesus got all the punishment that you and I deserve. So whenever you place your faith in him, we get all of the blessings that Jesus himself deserves for his sinless life. And that namely, that blessing is proximity and oneness and being together with God forever. Have you trusted in him? Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ? If you haven't, wherever you are, I want to invite you to pray with me. And listen, that word is scary. Pray is scary. Because some of you are, you're just, you're scrolling through Instagram, okay? And you keep seeing my face, right? And this is awkward because you're on your couch or you're in your bed late at night or maybe you're driving. Um, it's awkward, but I really want to invite you to pray with me. And we're going to just do something very simple. Thank you, sorry, and will you? Okay, so pray with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for what you did on the cross. Thank you for your focus in saving all of us. Thank you for your perfection and the fact that you sacrificed everything for us. Thank you for what you did. Thank you for the words of wisdom that you gave us and how to live this life. Thank you for giving us instruction just thank you for fresh mercy. The Bible says in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22 and 23, that there's fresh mercy every morning on account of who you are. So thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for dying for my sins and for that forgiveness. 
Now, God, I want to just say sorry. I ask, I've been sinful. I'm a sinful person in my actions, in my words, or even in my thoughts. Lord Jesus, will you please forgive my sins? Will you wash me clean of my sins? Lord, I, 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 I apologize for my sins. I have added to the chaos of this world. The brokenness in the world is not just out there, it's actually in here. The line between good and evil is not between races or political parties or people groups or gender. The line between good and evil is inside of me. And so often I've chosen evil. And God, I'm sorry. And I ask that you forgive me of my sins and I repent before you right now. And lastly, I just want to ask you, Lord, will you come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior? I am trusting you. I am trusting you in the sacrifice that you did on Calvary. I am trusting you to take the test for me. (laughs) You're a trustworthy, faithful God. I am trusting you to take the test for me on Judgment Day. I don't pass the tape recorder test, but I'm relying on you to help me pass that, Lord. Lord, will you please be my Lord and my Savior? It's in your amazing name that I ask you to bring the Holy Spirit in my heart. In your name I pray, amen. Amen. If you want to know more about following Jesus you know, and what it means to be a follower of Jesus and be a Christian, um, I advise you to ask your parents. Um, or you can come to Cornerstone anytime and ask me. Until then, keep your head in the clouds. Blessings.